Hi, everybody. Welcome to Attack with Larry C. I'm your host, Larry Christensen, and we're going to continue our uh, little discussion of uh, the great attacking player Boris Spassky. He needs no introduction. One of my favorite uh, attacking players of all time, especially in the modern era. A player of great uh, classical type style, really uh, old school, totally old school. Uh, he liked classical openings, both sides with white and black. Uh, very, rarely departing from E4 or D4. And uh, he adhered to the classical principles brought down by the likes of um, Tarash, Nimzovich, Botvinnik, and so forth. His games are, generally speaking, quite easy to understand as compared, let's say, to the uh, slightly more exotic and nerve-wracking games of Mikhail Tall. Um, so anyway, let's, let's, here's a couple examples of Spassky's uh, great attack. First of all, he had a great combinative talent, very, an eagle eye as a chess player, always ready to seize that opportunity to, uh, to strike. And let's, this is an example from a game by, uh, Boris played way back in 1989 from young rising star, Michael Adams was, uh, I think, just a mere teenager at this stage. And here we see Bat Boris with the black pieces. He's a pawn down um, and has been, at this time, very roughly treated by his youthful opponent. But uh, always uh, alert for counterattack. Uh, here's Boris on move 39, getting his two rooks into the gear with f5. That poses some Serious problems on White's position, and here Adams could not resist the opportunity to jump into with knight e6. What should he have done? He should have anticipated the importance of the f2 square and played rook e2. Uh, then, then White uh, maintains his uh, extra pawn and his advantage. But instead, he played, uh, I mean, black has some various tries, like knight to ce5. But in all cases, white answers that with rook f1 adequately. And white, black just simply does not have enough play for the pawn. Now knight e6 really is coming into focus for white. But instead, Adams played knight e6, and Spassky seizes his chance. On move 40 with F takes E4. And here the importance of uh, the F control of F2 is uh, illustrated. So now the one, point, point number one is after Rook takes F8 check, Rook takes F8, Knight takes F8, Black has the reply Knight F2 check. And if King H2, Knight takes H3 is uh, not easy to meet. For instance, if queen f1, black continues with knight f2 check, king g1, knight g4, not easy now for white to avert mate on edge 2 If queen f4, he picks off the rook. And if g3, black plays knight takes g1, discovered check, g takes f4, followed by knight f3 check. And here black also emerges with a decisive advantage. Instead of uh, rook takes f8, instead of knight takes f8, white should play instead knight takes e4, covering f2, preventing knight f2 check. And that should hold fairly comfortably for a white. If bishop takes e6, d takes e6, black has the tricky rook f3 available, threatening rook takes h3 check. But that white holds miraculously with knight f6 check, returning material to divert Black's attention away from h3. Then if knight takes f6, g takes f3 is workable for white. And if rook takes f6, white plays e7. Knight f2 check, and white black, uh, black must settle for a draw. After king h2, knight g4 check, king h1, and so forth. It's also, I believe, knight f2 check, queen takes f2 is, is equal as well. 
So instead of uh, rook takes f8 check, rook takes f8, knight takes e4, we see Adams here played bishop takes e4, and that turned out to be a costly mistake. Spassky plays knight f2 check. Now, if white plays king h2, black has the crushing knight e5. Where did that come from? Attacking the rook, also threatening a hor horrific knight e to g4 mate, and basically forcing white to give up surrender material, starting with rook g3. Bishop takes e6. Knight takes e6. Knight f g4 check. Rook takes g4. Knight takes g4 check. King h1. Queen g3. Threatening knight f2 check. H g4. Queen h4 check. Picks off the rook and the bishop. Compl very complicated tactics. Let's review this again. So after f takes e4. Rook takes f8 check. Rook takes f8. We think that knight takes f8. Knight f2 check. King h2. Knight takes h3. Wins for black. You should have played rook takes f8 check, rook takes f8, knight takes e4, and that seems to hold for white. Its, it's uh, position is roughly equal in that case. That's the correct defense. Thanks to the miraculous defense, bishop takes e6, de6, rook f3, knight f6 check. That's a move not easy to see. And now if, if bishop takes e4, now if after a knight f2 check, if king h2, black wins with knight e5, no doubt about it. Threatening mate, and if rook g3, knight e5 to g4 check, wins. So Adams had to give up the rook with rook takes f to the exchange. And Spassky now has a powerful rook on the second rank. White's queen is hemmed in. He does have a pawn for the exchange, but... The, uh, obviously, the situation has reversed itself. Spassky's active, alert, tactical ability has, um, again, proven very effective. So Adams here plays uh, bishop d3 to vacate the e4 square, possibly for a knight. Knight to coming to e4, also to eliminate that strong knight here. And Spassky uh, now... Retains his knight on d6 to d6 where it blockades the d-pawn. Uh, also, it's poised to invade the squares like f5 and e4. Classic play by Spassky. And Adams tries rook d1, uh, the, which is a good move. It's, it brings the uh, rook away from possible shots involving a queen on h4. For instance, well, rook takes g2 is a possibility in certain lines. So he gets his rook away from that possibility and also helps to guard his uh, d5 pawn. Spassky now very alertly finishes the game off with a final flurry. His rook on e8, he understands that bishop takes e6, d takes e6, would that give white unnecessary counterplay. So what he does is he plays rook e f8, anything to divert that strong knight on e6. And also he's threatening rook 8 to f3, very powerful attacking move. Adams really has little choice in the matter. He plays knight takes f8. He's busted otherwise. Spassky now strikes with bishop takes h3. So that whole rook sack just designed to bring that bishop to life. Adams desperately tries queen h2, and Spassky had foreseen everything here. Plays rook takes g2. Now queen takes g2, bishop takes g2. Check, king takes g2. Uh, is lost after queen g4 check. So that leaves only queen takes d6, and here Spassky plays rook takes a2. And he's visualized that there are no good checks for white. White's a piece up, actually two pieces up, but in a completely hopeless position. So here Adams resigned, facing inevitable mate. And that brings us now to one of the uh, classic 
Boris Spassky victories. This was from one of my favorite Spassky games. Very hard fought, well played encounter by kind of by both players. This was from the 1973 USSR Championship, which Spassky won in great style. Uh, that was the uh, tournament that saw his comeback after his disastrous defeat to Fisher and uh, put him on the path, well, to uh, top five status at any rate at that time. USSR Championship, 1973. Okay, it starts, uh, this is the Knight B5 uh, line of the time and all that forces a Meroxy bind. This is the Meroxy bind, of course. The, of course, there's a drawback. The Knight ends up on the inferior A3 square, but uh, establishing that bind is uh, quite attractive. Nowadays, people prefer b6 followed by bishop b7, but uh, Overkin plays a perfectly acceptable line, bishop d7. Slightly stodgy compared to b6, but quite playable. One bonus feature of bishop d7, and it facilitates the potential break b7, b5. Spassky develops, rook b8, there he goes, b5. White has to... Uh, try to throttle the b7, b5 break. So he'd like to put a bishop on f3 here, but that would, of course, surrender control over b5. So uh, he's got to keep an eye out for that. Spassky plays rook c1, a good developing move. Um, but perhaps it might, it might have been better to play queen d2 directly, followed by f4. Now, Black has to be careful. He never wants to play queen c7 in this type of position because that might succumb to a knight d5, typical cheap shot in this kind of formation. Maybe white plays uh, f3 first, or f4, bishop f3, followed by knight d5. The queen does not belong on c7. Instead, Overkin plays queen a5, connecting rooks. Also, the queen may join in allowing, enabling b7, b5. Spassky plays f4. Black plays rook f8, and now he also makes white uh, keep in mind a potential d6, d5 break. Any of those breaks, if, if allowed to um, happen successfully, black has an equal game or better. So Spassky here is playing to stop both d5 and b5. So he plays queen d2. There's something to be said for queen e1 as well, with the intent of playing queen f2 directly. Queen d2 may have been a slight waste of time. Overkin you now brings his bishop out of the, off of d7 and uh, unblocks the rook on d8. And here Spassky has to really deal with d6, d5. Plays rook f d1. Not bishop f3, of course, would allow b7, b5. So you just got to play rook f d1. Overkin plays knight b4. That's an active knight move designed to, uh, to enable b7, b5. So here Spassky has played, I would sli slightly second rate in the opening. With, per with accurate, accurate play, it should be about equal. But uh, from Spassky was never a big opening um, aficionado. He was that's his expertise was in the in the middle game and direct attack combinations middle game. That was Spassky's forte. And here he plays queen e one. He might, might have uh, wanted to play, preferred that move a bit earlier. Headed for f two. Overkin now breaks. Perfectly good move, but from Overkin. And now Spassky plays king h1. Now he understands that b takes c4, knight takes c4 will favor white. So he keeps, um, improves his king position and prepares uh, his forces for the inevitable e4, e5 break. That's what he's looking to play. Now, in this position, Overkin may have considered bishop c6, 
when Spassky should probably continue bishop f3 protecting the pawn on e4. And then what does black do here? He still can't play b takes c4 yet. Uh, then probably rook d c8. That's to provide a good retreat square for the queen. And then white can pursue his attacking ideas with queen g3. Looks like a good move. Preparing e4, e5 at long last. And it looks like white has uh, pressure, very strong pressure in this position. Black's achieved his break, desired break, but uh, he's sort of all dressed up with nowhere to go. Overkin's actual continuation looks like the best, the best uh, line of play. What did he do? He played rook d c eight directly. He wants to play b takes c four as quickly as possible. Now Spassky strikes. Did he have to? He doesn't. He'd like to play bishop f three, but then b takes c four works. And if white plays queen g3, then black can consider uh, bishop c6, putting pressure on e4, and then bishop f3, then knight takes a2 is possible. Knight takes a2, b4 is interesting, with wild complications. So instead of queen g3, though, Kaspersky's attention turned to resolving the tension in the, on the queen side and playing c takes b5. He has in mind a quick e4, e5. Okay, there it goes, e5. So d takes e5, f takes e5 is forced. And also now if black plays knight fd5, knight takes d5, e takes d5 should favor white. So Overkin plays knight e5. Now Spassky has to worry about um, his e5 pawn. What to do about that? What does he do? He had long planned this. Now he plays knight a takes b5. This opens a Pandora's box of complications that Spassky excels with. Overkin answers with the perfectly logical knight takes e5. And Spassky now plays bishop f4, pinning that knight, offering up that knight on b5 for the knight on e5. So bishop takes b5, knight takes b5 just simply wins for white. Rook takes c1 check, rook takes c1, rook takes b5 is met by rook c8 check and white wins. Overkin finds the best move, knight e to d3. Must take, and now black takes here. So white, white's rook's under attack, black's rook's under attack. Now Spassky turns his attention to the king side with rook g3. And here we get a fatal misjudgment from Overkin, a very complicated position. What should he do? His best move, no doubt about it, is simply to play bishop a6, offering that rook on b8. After bishop takes b8, rook takes b8, black has a very significant compensation for his material deficit. Those bishops are very strong in this open position. He's got a very safe king, good pawn structure, pressure against b2. White's forces are somewhat disjointed. The rook on g3 now is quite misplaced. It'll uh, not easy for white to... Uh, reorganize. Black has threats like uh, bishop h4. Basic verdict, it would I would say, is uh, chances for both sides. Black, I think it looks like dynamic equality, especially in a practical game. Now, Spassky may have been thinking about playing instead rook takes g7 check, king takes g7, queen g3 check, king h8, and bishop takes b8. Then if rook g8, white can play queen e5 check and enjoy a uh, extra pawn endgame.
But instead of uh, the hasty rook g8, black should instead play f6. That prepares rook g8, prevents check a check on e5, and makes it difficult for white to consolidate. Black's basic plan is to now focus his attention on white's g2 pawn. This very strong counterattack is in the works. I would say black has full compensation for the pawn. Now, this is, these are very tough judgment calls. Easy to make that Monday morning quarterback call. But uh, that Bishop A6 would have been Overkin's best choice. But one can hardly blame him for playing Rook B6, which looks like a great move. He's about to play Rook B C6. Now, if White plays Queen E5, Black answers with F6. Now, notice the Rook guards the E6 square. Pawn. If white tries the tricky knight d5 here, black plays queen takes e1 check, rook takes e1, e takes d5, rook takes e7, and now rook f6 suddenly wins for black thanks to white's back rank problems. But unfortunately for Overkin, Spassky's eagle eye really uh, he had a great vision of the board, always looking at those forcing moves, and he comes up with the pinning move, decisive move, bishop e5. And this works by double attack on g7 and c7. He's got to take. And there it is, queen e5, threatening mate, basically deciding the game. Now black's too disorganized to form a vi any kind of viable defense. So Spassky now is up material, plus he's got the initiative. And we're treated to a very fine uh, winning conclusion from Spassky. Overkin tries EG6, takes pure desperation, Bishop H4. Now Spassky could have won easily with Rook G4, and Black's Bishop has nowhere to go. But I think he zeroed in on one particular winning line and went with it. Rook at, he saw this is he could determine this line was a absolute forced win, albeit in a complicated way. Now, Overkin defends with Bishop E8. It looks like he's on the verge of very significant counterplay, but Spassky now puts it away with Rook takes F7, always looking for those forcing moves. Bishop takes, and now because the Black's so preoccupied on the Queen side. Simply rook f1 finishes the job. Now, if queen a8, white wins with rook takes f7. That's easy to see. So, of course, the threat of queen takes e8 check is in the air. He tried the desperate bishop e8, and now Spassky comes through with queen c8, threatening mate in two on f8. Overkin tries king g7. There it is, the mate threat. Black has uh, no defense. If queen c5, for instance, white plays rook f7, check king g5, queen g8, or queen h8 with uh, mate just on the horizon. Said he played bishop f6, and now that uh, knight joins the party, knight e4, threatening the bishop. Black, uh, now if queen a6, for instance, here, white simply plays rook takes f6. So uh, here he tried e5 at least to get the rook connected, but then he resigned. And after knight takes f6 in view of rook takes, queen e7 check, winning the rook. One of Spassky's great games, that was 1970 through three. That's um, uh, Spassky chimes uh, from Moscow, 1973. And that'll do it for uh, this episode of Attack with Larry C. Thanks, everyone, for joining me.